Hello and welcome to this video post. I am glad you're here. We are, or I am, responding to the question, is the Bible error-free? I recently blogged uh, on this same topic, is the Bible error-free? And in fact, if you wanted to read the article, you can go to peterewatts.com uh, or there's a link below this video. What I'd like to do in this video is I'd like to give a short summary of why this topic is important um, and sort of clarify some of the underlying assumptions of what is called the biblical inerrancy view. Full disclosure right away before we begin is that I am a Christian. Uh, I love and follow the person of Jesus Christ. It's because of my faith in Jesus that I'm even raising this question. I'll go as far as to say I am a Bible-believing Christian, and, and that's not a phrase I usually throw out because it's often associated with political, a political party and political agenda that, that I, I don't buy into. But um, I am a Bible-believing Christian, meaning I trust the, there, that there is truth about life, about God, about people, about relationships, about uh, life on earth and life... Uh, when we die and uh, and so I am a Bible believing Christian let's get right to the question is the Bible error free Christians often talk about the Bible being inerrant inerrant means without error so the view of biblical inerrancy is the view that the Bible is without error most people I know who believe in biblical inerrancy have at least 10 assumptions uh, associated with that view. In this video, I'm going to sort of touch on or respond to two of them. If you want to read about the other eight, you can go to peterewatts.com, like I said. So let's get right to it. The first assumption that a lot of people have about the Bible or, the bibli or about biblical inerrancy is that for any of the Bible to be true, all of the Bible needs to be true. So for any of the Bible to be true, all of the... So in other words, if there's one error or there's one issue or there's one contradiction or one inconsistent teaching, um, it all falls apart. Um, it's kind of the all or nothing view is what it's also been called. The second assumption people bring to the idea of or their approach to the Bible and biblical inerrancy is this that the biblical authors are in complete agreement with each other. In other words, there aren't any real contradictions, legitimate ones in the Bible. That what, assume, uh, what appears, some of the contradictions that appear like contradictions are not real. They just, they're an appearance of a contradiction. And there are theologians and pastors that, and writers, authors that go to great lengths to sort of uh, prove that or, or to, to sort of make that um, uh, sort of support the view of biblical inerrancy. Now, I, like many other Christians around the world, for many years of my life, believed in the view of biblical inerrancy, that the Bible is without error. Um, at the same time, the more I read the Bible in my 20s, the more I was honest about what I was reading. And it took some time and it took some sort of sorting out. But I began to come to this place of acknowledging that the Bible contains not an appearance of contradictions, but very real contradictions. And that posed some problems for me uh, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, it posed some real problems. And I, I was trying to um, sort of not deal with them in, in one sense, or deal with them with quick and easy answers. I wanna share just two of those problems that I came across. One is, one of the problems I came across uh, was that the Bible includes two accounts of ancient Israel's uh, monarchy that have some very real contradictions and inconsistent details. Uh, included in them. So you can find the first account in the book of Samuel and Kings, and then the second account is found in the two-part book of Chronicles. 
When I read and compared and I contrasted uh, these two accounts of the monarchy, I began to notice that specific details were not only a little different, but they were a lot different, very different. Some of the kings that, let's say, the first author of Samuel and Kings, uh, so it would be the Kings book is specifically where the uh, monarchy is found in that first author. Uh, some of the details that that first author would include about the kings um, were very different than the details that the second author of Chronicles dealt with. So one author would paint a number of kings um, as almost like saints, following God, obeying God, uh, being holy, righteous people. And then you have this other author that's describing them as th those same people as being uh, wicked or idolatrous or disobedient. And for me, I had to come to a point where I recognized this wasn't just a matter of each author dealing with two different time periods. So let's say one author's potentially dealing with the first 10 years of that king's life, and then the second author is dealing with the last 10 years of that king's life. What I began to find is actually they were talking about some of the same time periods and attributing characteristics or des descriptions about them that were divergently different um, or divergent from each other. So I began, that was one big contradiction for me that I came across in the Bible. And I had sort of read through that every year but uh, w w when I would do a read through of the Bible, but I, I, I thought there must be a, an answer for this. And, I, and I, so I, want, I held to biblical inerrancy as much as I could. Uh, one of the, the second th examples that I came to that showed me there's very real problems in the Bible was the inconsistent teaching in the Bible on how people of faith, meaning God's people um, in the Bible, uh, beginning with ancient Israel, should deal with their enemies. So inconsistent teaching in the Bible about how people of faith should deal uh, with their enemies. In fact, it's not just that this is an inconsistent teaching in the Bible. It's that it's a divergent teaching. Very different. Um, so let's get into that. For example, there are a large number of biblical authors who believe that the way you treat and respond to and deal with enemies is through retaliation and vengeance. And with that is the implication, physical aggression, physical violence. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Some of them even suggest that God told them to commit genocide uh, against a different people, a uh, different people group. Uh, and the Canaan account is one, uh, the Canaan mandate uh, is one of those uh, genocidal commands. One of the Biblical authors suggested that God was even the agent of a genocide in history. And you could probably guess which one that is in the first, uh, within the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. At the same time, there are other biblical authors um, that believe the opposite, that you don't treat enemies with retaliation. This group of biblical authors believe that Jesus commanded his followers to not retaliate against their enemies. Instead, love your enemies and pray for your enemies, including those who physically and verbally persecute you. That sounds like two different teachings. Instead of treating our enemies with hate and retaliation, these biblical authors believe that we are to, uh, as followers of Jesus, give our lives sacrificially for our enemies, just like Jesus did. An example of this is in 1 John 3.16, which kind of matches John 3.16. If our enemies ask to walk one mile, and you can find what I'm quoting right now in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, if our enemies ask us to walk one mile, Jesus said, walk with them a second. If they strike us on the cheek, we should turn our other toward them so that they can strike our other. So while in some sense, Jesus seems to be commanding a... Uh, Conf uh, we're still confronting our enemies, but the way that we confront them is different. 
We're not confronting them in the like. We're not confronting them physical aggression with physical aggression. We're still confronting them, but we're doing it different. If our enemies curse us, we should bless them. You can find that in Romans 12 and, and as well as Matthews 5 through 7. So to me, I came to this place where the fact that there are two divergent ways of telling Christians or people of faith how to treat our enemies, that was a big deal for me. And that was a big problem for me. And the standard quick fix answers no longer worked for me because they seem to be covering over the issue that the Bible contains real problems. Part of the issue for me with the problems in the Bible is not just the fact that they exist, although that's big and it's, and it's a big deal when someone can acknowledge that um, and that they're not a figment of our imagination. But the other thing for me, part of the issue, is that so many Christians seem to ignore or cover them over, cover over them. And for many of us who grew up going to church, when they were dealt with, um, the answers sort of given in response uh, didn't have a lot of substance to them. You see, many of us were taught that the Bible is not supposed to have contradictions. It's not supposed to have any resemblance of error. It's not supposed to have inconsistent teaching. So, what I have found is that in, when I begin to have questions, I begin to find out that there are certain questions that were looked down on in churches I was part of. Maybe you've experienced the same thing, like questions about the Bible's contradictions. Contradictions and inconsistent teaching and other unsavory parts of the Bible are, were just sort of swept under the carpet. They just they weren't really dealt with very well. Part of the reason we can't, and this is my view, and I think there are a lot of Christians who hold to this, part of the reason we can't and don't deal with the problems in the Bible very well is that we don't really deal very well with problems in general in the Christian faith, like problems in our own homes, problems in our marriages, problems we face daily internally, uh, whether emotional or, or psychological or social, socially related. Um, problems that we attempt to cover up or just ignore. Secrets that we keep and don't share with others. I think that when we don't take time to meaningfully engage with our problems in our lives, or for that matter, problems in our Bibles, we are enabling a sort of immature Christian faith a faith that lacks authenticity and humility. But when we choose to lay down our aversion to problems in life and problems in the Bible, what we are doing constructively, I think, is number one, we're creating space for a mature and deeper faith to develop that is not afraid of questions and not afraid of our problems. And the second thing that I think... Uh, this does when we lay down our aversion to problems is we're, we're creating opportunity to see an important truth of scripture that is very much a part of its central theme but we often miss and here's that truth that the god of the universe the god of the the world and the cosmos has entered into this world not to pretend it wasn't a mess or to cover up all the messes as if they don't exist and that God was embarrassed to expose the truth about the creation God created. No, instead God entered into our world in the mess of our problems and our problem-filled lives and he became present with us. The truth of the incarnation is that God entered our world and became present with us in our problems in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. I don't know about you, but for me, that is really good news. 
If you'd like to dive more into this topic, I wrote, like I said in the beginning of, of this post, I wrote a recent blog uh, with the same title as The Bible Air Free. You can get it by clicking on the link below this video. I hope you, that you do. Uh, uh, feel free to like it. Feel free to share it on uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, or any social media outlet. Um, thank you for taking time to, to listen to this video and listen to me sort of ramble on on a topic that I think is an incredibly important topic for us Christians to deal with. Um, talk about it with others. Rethink it. Read your Bible, actually. Take time to reread the Bible and reread some of the passages I brought up and some of the passages I bring up in the post. Um, I think you'll be better for it, and it will, it'll, it will shape your life in, in profound ways. Um, have a great day, and take care, everybody.